Good afternoon. I'm Jim Duff, the executive editor and director of the Supreme Court Historical Society. It's my honor to welcome you to our virtual platform for today's conversation with Peter Canellis. Peter and I had the privilege of discussing his excellent book, The Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan, America's judicial hero, at the Sixth Circuit Judicial Conference uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, this past fall. And uh, we wanted to thank Judge David Hale and uh, Chief Judge Jeff Sutton for that great opportunity. And uh, it went so well, we thought we would uh, do a repeat performance today for our Supreme Court Historical Society. And Judge Hale may very well be in our audience today. Hmm. Let me give a brief introduction of Peter's remarkable career. Um, I blended my own title with his actually at the beginning, uh, his editorial work. Uh, Peter is the managing editor for uh, Enterprise at Politico. And he's also been Politico's executive editor overseeing the newsroom uh, during the 2016 presidential coverage and the editorial page editor of the Boston Globe. A native of Boston, Peter is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, <coughs> Pennsylvania and Columbia Law School. <clears throat> he spent most of his career at the Globe where at various points he oversaw the paper's local news coverage and Washington DC Bureau. As the Globe's editorial page editor, he authored numerous editorials. He also edited the Globe's book, Last Lion, The Fall and Rise of Ted Kennedy, which was a top 10 New York Times bestseller in 2009. For the past 12 years, Peter has worked with the International Women's Media Foundation, overseeing the Elizabeth Newfer Award Fellowship, and which is given to a woman journalist from around the world to study human rights uh, at MIT and intern at the Globe and New York Times. Peter considers many young journalists he's hired and mentored over the years to be his greatest accomplishment. I would add to that uh, series of accomplishments, the publication of his book, The Great Dissenter, The Story of John Marshall Harlan. And um, as we get into the discussion of that today, I will note that uh, at the end of our discussion, Peter will be taking questions from the audience. So please drop your questions into the Q&A box on your Zoom window and we will get to as many of those uh, as we can. As we get started, I'd like to make a personal observation first, and then we can jump, jump into the substance of Peter's great work. Um, I'll start by observing that when I was counselor to Chief Justice Rehnquist, I thought he was clairvoyant. Uh, he wrote a number of books, three of which were published at times when current events almost uh, immediately preceding uh, the publication of the book and following mirrored uh, the historic ones of which he wrote. He wrote all the laws but one, which is about, about suspension of habeas corpus uh, during the Civil War and then 9-11 occurred. He wrote grand inquests about the impeachment trials of uh, Samuel Chase and President Andrew Jackson. And he wrote Centennial Crisis um, about the closest election in American history, which at that time was Hayes Tilden. And then shortly followed, uh, following the publication of his book, we had Bush versus Gore. Uh, I'm still impressed by that, but then I read Peter's book on Justice Harlan, and I was stunned by how many issues that Justice Harlan addressed, which remain both pertinent uh, to this day and were in some instances a uh, hundred years ahead of his time. Uh, he spoke to and addressed issues of racial equality, voting rights, antitrust, uh, the first trust busting cases, uh, workers' rights, constitutional rights, uh, and others. And we're going to review those in the course of our discussion today. And uh, we want to integrate also in the discussion as Peter does in his book, the most significant influences in his life uh, and his evolving views, uh, his family, the role they played, uh, his lifelong relationship with Robert Harlan and uh, his affinity for his daughter, Edith, uh, and the impact of her death, among other uh, topics. 
let's get started, uh, Peter, with how uh, you uh, became interested in writing the book. And you've been on the road, um, including uh, at the Sixth Circuit Judicial Conference, uh, talking about your book, um, a common description of our uh, the American political scene today is one of polarization. Uh, I'd like to get your observations about uh, Justice Harlan in that context and uh, what you're observing um, uh, in, in uh, the, the way Justice Harlan uh, sort of makes a bridge. Well, he, he definitely does make a bridge and it, it's been quite heartening actually to see people uh, whose own views on current issues diverge quite a bit uh, all see things in the Harlan legacy that they uh, they really share and are impressed by and, and view as uh, ennobling to themselves. So just last weekend, I was in Chicago, uh, had a couple of events, one of them sponsored by the American Constitution Society. Uh, there was a larger event in Naperville where uh, a lot of leaders of the Chicago uh, legal community who are Black, African-American legal community uh, came out. Also, number of judges and prosecutors, uh, many of them progressives, uh, uh, delighted in the Harlan story. You know, next weekend, uh, we, the weekend after next, I'm going to be going to um, San Antonio for the Fifth Circuit Judicial Conference invited by uh, Judge Don Willett, who uh, is a Harlan lover and has a dog named Harlan, uh, and, you know, also to do an event with the Federalist Society down there. And you see people of, of very divergent views all finding something in the Harlan story. And that's because uh, he his life shows that you can be uh, an originalist, a textualist, at least within his definition, and also be somebody who is, uh, you know, has a firm sense of, of justice and fairness to the actual litigants in the case and, and concerned about the longer term implications for American society. And uh, so he's, he's quite the unique figure. Um, uh, you, you may know Josh Blackman, Jim, uh, he had tried to find a, a, a suitable name for a, a legal center that he was creating down in Texas that was supposed to be bipartisan. And they went through name after name after name after name, every legal figure pretty much in the history of the United States. And they only found two that both sides agreed on. One was Harlan and the other was Robert Jackson. So uh, mm. Harlan occupies a unique place, I think, in our in our current day discussions as well. He, he truly does. And I think and I encourage all, all in our audience to read your book, but uh, you'll, you'll certainly come away from it uh, with that recognition as well. Uh, his influences um, early in life. Let's talk a little bit about the environment in which he grew up, uh, how he got his name, uh, what his family relationship was uh, with Henry Clay, those uh, kinds of influences on his views uh, and nationalism. He was, uh, he was born in Kentucky in 1833 to a, a very, very patriotic family. Uh, his father was uh, the leading lawyer in Kentucky and dreamed of uh, creating a family law firm. He also collected the largest uh, private collection of law books in Kentucky. He was part of a, a generation of people who had uh, moved from Virginia to Kentucky and felt like they were creating this, this truly enlightened community on the, on the western edge, right in the heartland, the bluegrass country. And... Um, and yet there was a shadow uh, over his life from his earliest days. So he has this father who's preaching to him the unique uh, value and importance of the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution at a time when every other country was ruled by some form of despotism. And uh, he clearly viewed America as the, as the greatest hope for all of mankind. And yet he saw in his own you know, community uh, the seeds of its destruction. Uh, his entire youth was spent uh, living under the shadow of the looming civil war. His father was a very close friend of Henry Clay, who was the great compromiser. And uh, they came to believe that, you know, what Henry Clay was doing in exploring everything from colonization to compensating slave owners to geographical balances of power was an honorable effort to preserve uh, the greatness of the United States and preserve the American system. They, they felt it would be destroyed. They also felt their own state would be destroyed because it was uh, so divided and it was right there in, in prime place to be the battlefield. 
So I think that gave him this, this heightened sense of fear and preciousness about the American experience. He also, as you alluded to, had in his own home, uh, Robert Harlan, who was believed to be the half brother of his half brother and the son of his father from before his father was married, who was uh, technically enslaved, a man of mixed race, um, denied education because he was black, but right away from a very early age became a, a unique charismatic figure, a pioneer in horse racing. You know, he developed this expertise Robert Harlan did in sort of finding ways to succeed against the, the terrible odds that black people faced then even, even facing slavery. But horse racing was one place where at that time black people had a chance because a lot of the, the, slave, uh, the horse owners were, uh, were slavers themselves, slave owners themselves. And so a lot of the, um, the people who did the work of training and jockeying and actually creating the racing industry were black. And so he helped to stage races and things. He then also was a pioneer in the gold rush. He was part of the first group of Kentuckians to go down uh, the Mississippi and cross Panama, crossing you know rainforests and mountains and things like that, and then going all the way up the West Coast to San Francisco. And he came back, Robert Harlan did as a young man with uh, four to six million dollars in today's dollars in gold and dragging a chest basically full of gold. <laughs> and um, he, uh, he then uh, became the leading, he moved across the river to Cincinnati and became the leading black citizen in Cincinnati and funded black owned businesses through Cincinnati, including a photography studio that is, is still renowned for, for uh, uh, its pioneering work. Uh, and also a, a, a hostelry uh, that, that was serving the sort of many uh, free Blacks who came off of um, the steamboats that were coming into Cincinnati. It, it was sort of a fancy gaming place up top, but they also uh, hid runaway slaves in the, in the basement. So he was right in the middle of the churning politics of the 1850s. And I think both John Harlan and Robert Harlan suffered, felt like they suffered greatly under the Dred Scott decision. So those are some of the those are some of the roots that uh, contributed to uh, to Harlan's jurisprudence in later years. It's a wonderful read, and you do a great job of uh, juxtaposing um, uh, Robert Harlan's career and life uh, with John Marshall Harlan's, and uh, tracking them both and how they intertwined. And, and uh, uh, it's it's a, you do a very good job of that. I also think you did a fine job of um, chronicling racism in, in the United States. And it wasn't just in the South, it was North and South. The book opens with uh, double standards for admission to concerts uh, at the Grand Opera House in New York City in 1879, post-Civil War. Uh, and uh, there are other examples that you uh, woven uh, through the uh, telling of their stories. Um, there was an, even a a civil rights case filed by uh, Robert Harlan in uh, Hamilton County uh, in, in Cincinnati that languished, I think, for years um, uh, before being dismissed in 1915. Um, it, the impact of that, it, it, what was John Marshall Harlan's um, awareness of, of those sorts of episodes in Robert's life? Did, did they stay in contact um, throughout their lives? They, they stayed in contact as, as adults. We don't know as much about the years when John Harlan was on the court. And it may just be that the letters were not collected during that time. And John Harlan was doing so much work on the court, so much writing, because when you're writing these important dissents as he was, you're also doing you know, your share of the main work <laughs> doing the majority opinion. So John Harlan didn't write a lot in the second half of his life. And Robert Harlan spent a lot of time in Washington during that time. So they may have actually been in contact with the person, but we don't have a great sense of the contours of their late relationship. But we do have a, a sense of their uh, relationship at the time that John Harlan was being appointed to the Supreme Court. So Robert Harlan had become the most famous black citizen, the wealthiest black citizen of Cincinnati. He then left after the Dred Scott decision and the Fugitive Slave Act, which uh, you'll remember caused uh, a tremendous racial pressure in places like Cincinnati because there were uh, slave catchers that were trying to like, catch African-American people, return them to their masters for, for money at that time. So Robert Harlan used his money to buy three prize thoroughbreds and go to England on this uh, uh, endeavor to try to like uh, 
create a series of races challenging uh, the Brit the the British uh, racers in the sport of kings, you know, trying to show that Kentucky horses were superior. He didn't entirely succeed, but he did become a noted figure in Europe and traveled all over the continent. And when he left after the Civil War, 12 years later, actually, when he came back to Cincinnati, uh, British racing journals, you know, paid tribute to him. He was a he was a, a major figure there. Uh, but then he came back to Cincinnati and became the leading black politician in, in Cincinnati. John Harlan had fought in the Civil War, fought valiantly uh, both on the battlefield, but also in trying to keep Kentucky neutral. I mean, it, it, one of the most important chapters of his career was, you know, involved uh, sleeping on the floor of the state legislature to try to prevent the uh, Confederate sympathizing governor, Beriah McGoffin, from uh, trying to, to win over members of the legislature to the Confederate cause. He also accepted the so-called Lincoln guns. There were The federal government sent guns into a group of loyalists in case Confederates uh, tried to seize the state. And Harlan, who had never uh, been a fighting man at all, you know, was sort of suddenly this, uh, you know, harboring guns and hiding them out and trying to, try, trying to create sort of secret networks of Union sympathizers. Uh, but then he openly recruited uh, a very large regiment and, and fought valiantly for a number of years. Uh, he came back after fighting to, uh, to Kentucky uh, to find that the Johnson administration and the Lincoln administration, the later Lincoln administration, had, point, had put Kentucky under martial law. And um, he was the elected uh, uh, you know, attorney general at that time representing the state and was sort of obliged to be challenging it all the way down the line. And I think he also felt a personal sense of betrayal that here he had literally, you know, stood on street corners in Louisville with, with a bullhorn on his hand, you know, imploring people to stay loyal to the union with the agreement he felt with the Lincoln administration that Kentucky would choose its own path after the war. At that time, you know, the war was not about ending slavery or changing the relationship between states and the federal government. It was about uh, preserving the union so he was under a lot of pressure. All these friends and neighbors who had backed him were saying, you know, we're now on being treated like a defeated territory and stuff. So he was busy challenging that. But it led to him being slow to embrace the post-Civil War amendments. So by the time he's nominated for the court, it was Rutherford B. Hayes, who had uh, part of that, that Hayes-Tilden election that you had uh, referenced earlier, had promised to put a Southerner on the court to replace David Davis, who had uh, resigned to join the Senate. So uh, Harlan fit the bill just barely by being from Kentucky, but there certainly weren't a lot of like loyal Republicans at that time. And by then he had also fully converted to Republicanism and was a very full-throated uh, supporter of civil rights, but people doubted it because of his Kentucky background. And the Judiciary Committee at the time was controlled by a Northern civil rights activist, uh, Jim, uh, James Edmonds from Vermont, Senator Edmonds from Vermont being the, the foremost of them. And um, so Robert Harlan had stayed in contact with the Harlan family. You know, he had uh, gave a very lavish gift at the, the Har one of the Harlan daughters' weddings. Uh, he had provided some financial support and moral support for one of John's brothers when he became an alcoholic and drug addict. And he had also worked with John in politics, both of them supporting uh, ben Bristow and then, and then Rutherford Hayes in, in 1876 when the Republican convention was in Cincinnati. And they were, there were letters between them strategizing about this campaign. And then when uh, John's uh, being put forward as a potential Supreme Court uh, nominee, Robert goes to Washington to sort of reassure some of these civil rights activists that you know, he grew up in the same house as John Harlan. John Harlan's a good man on civil rights. So, so Robert Harlan was, was very much a part of his life up to that point. Uh, and stayed in touch with the Harlan family. And even though Robert Harlan became a famous man later in life, he always described himself as having been raised by James Harlan, who was the father of John, and uh, seemed to maintain very positive views of the Harlan family, which is, you know, a, a sort of difficult thing to process when you think that, you know, he was uh, enslaved in that household, even though he was treated more like a family member. It, it's it's a fascinating story. Uh, and, and um you, you mentioned before getting on the court, there was a brief um, uh, period in uh, John Marshall Harlan's uh, life that he dabbled in politics uh, or for political office. Can you describe that a, a little bit more and then we'll get into his court years? 
He did. I mean, he, from his very early days, in his early 20s, uh, he really engaged in political issues during that time. He was a unionist. He was a moderate. He was sort of in the clay mold of trying to find compromises to avoid the Civil War. But he would go town to town in Kentucky and was renowned for his charisma and his, uh, his excellent oratory, which is, stands in stark contrast to his father, who was uh, known as sort of a bright man, but was seen as a very reserved, difficult person to process and not charismatic at all on the stump. John was the opposite. He was, he was a showman almost on the, on the stump. Uh, and then he um, uh, did indeed run for office at various points uh, and succeeded in being elected attorney general after his father passed away in 1863, which was a big turning point in his life. Uh, so he served in public office during that time. But then um, quickly the politics of Kentucky were changing and becoming very, very polarized. Um, basically, even after the Civil War, Republicans had very little support in Kentucky. Uh, so he was part of a, a series of sort of moderate unionist parties uh, that, that sort of preceded the Republican Party in some ways. Uh, and then made a big uh, switch in 1868 and sort of declared himself to be a Republican, knowing that he was pretty much jeopardizing his chances of ever being elected to office in Kentucky. But nonetheless, just based on his sort of personal prestige alone, he ran two respectable races for governor as a Republican, but was very, very uh, forceful in embracing the Republican ideology. He was not uh, trying to be sort of a moderate who took on the Republican title, but emphasized how Kentucky actually had different views. He became increasingly outspoken about civil rights. He got to know Frederick Douglass uh, very well. Uh, he was challenged on the stump uh, for having been friendly with Frederick Douglass and strongly and openly defended uh, Frederick Douglass as a fine, honorable man. Uh, he gave many speeches in Kentucky talking about how he had once uh, uh, been slow to to embrace the abolition cause, but he now thanks God that the the bright sun of America does not shine on any uh, enslaved people and calling uh, slavery a perfect despotism and things like that. So he was very very forceful, um, increasingly forceful in his views on civil rights. And what changed him was the the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this was a man whose family and himself was dedicated to creating an enlightened community in Kentucky. You know, their writings early on were full of, of praise for the education system in Kentucky. He was deeply proud of Center College where he went. He was a devout leader of the Presbyterian Church, which was a very moderating influence on, on Kentucky's politics. He was um, in every way uh, a believer that, that, you know, Kentucky was a, a positive progressive expression of what America could be. And then after the war uh, with the rise of, of the Klan itself and other sort of parallel organizations in Kentucky, he grew increasingly concerned uh, about what was uh, uh, being done in the name of maintaining uh, racial uh, segregation and racial superiority of whites. Uh, ben Bristow was an influence on him. Uh, he was a, a prosecutor who kind of believed that the legal system had to step in uh, where you, you know you're not you're not able to keep troops and martial law forever, uh, so you needed a robust enforcement of the law to try to you know le keep order in society, uh, and that included anti-Klan laws, that included civil rights acts, civil rights laws. Um, so he increasingly came to embrace what what in the time would have been seen as the the full Republican ideology. And, and President Hayes appointed him uh, to the court um, in, in, in part because he was a Southerner. Uh, do you want to describe the, the, the thinking behind that? And then we'll, we'll uh, jump into his, uh, uh, some of his more well-known cases or dissents, I should say. Well, I think one of the little known kind of, you know, backroom deals, sort of vague promises that was made was to put a Southerner on the court because uh, the, the court was all Northerners, um, and uh, uh, you know the, the Republican Party was looking for ways to sort of appease the Democrats and Southerners at that time, and feel like they would have more representation, so they would at least accept Hayes as president, um, with some reluctance, certainly. Um, and uh, and then, of course, Hayes fell into this problem where the the Senate was controlled by much more uh, so-called radical Republicans, you know, civil rights supporting Republicans. And he had made this promise, and there were very few people that actually could thread that needle of being an effective representative of the South, but also being acceptable to the uh, the stronger uh, civil rights-oriented Republicans. Uh, 
so Harlan got that. Um, he also had a political debt uh, to Hayes because he had thrown Bristow's support to Hayes for the nomination and actually played a kind of a uh, very important role in that 1876 convention in helping Hayes get the nomination. So, so Harlan um, uh, achieved the nomination and, you know, everybody knew, you were asking before about his, his name, you know, he was named for his father's great hero, of course, the first, uh, uh, the great, well, not the first Chief Justice, but the greatest Chief Justice in the early days of the Supreme Court, uh, John Marshall. Um, and, and I think there was a certain kind of almost a uh, prophecy in that and, uh, and, and also a great hope in that because uh, James Harlan believed that, uh, only the law could solve the sectional crisis that was coming. You know, they, they would, you know, John Marshall had declared the, the supremacy of the law and courts over politics, essentially, um, when he declared the power of judicial review and, uh, the Harlans were looking to, the wisdom of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to to kind of solve the problems to bring America together. So he was always a strong John from the earliest days was a strong believer in the law, strong believer in the Constitution. He was always probably had in the back of his mind that nothing would be more a greater honor than to be on the Supreme Court. So he was an eager <laughs> candidate for the court. The other thing that was interesting is all among those Northerners, they all may have had perfect records on civil rights and they all may have been abolitionists in their day, uh, at least politically, but uh, almost none of them, at, at first, none of them had fought in the Civil War. Uh, some had hired replacements. Uh, and they also were largely the product of the post-war economic boom and the rising uh, power of the trusts, uh, which, which uh, enriched all these corporate attorneys. So the court that John Harlan was joining was, was full of these essentially wealthy Northeastern corporate lawyers who had been arguing before the uh, New Jersey and New York legislatures to try to preserve the rights of big business um, and had never really met black people. You know, they, they agreed with uh, abolition and, you know, they had a clean record before the Civil War, which Harlan did not. But Harlan was, was there on the, you know, front lines of this dispute uh, having, you know, close personal relationships with people like Robert Harlan and there's respectful professional relationships with people like Frederick Douglass and a whole range of African-Americans down in Kentucky. Um, and so he, he saw the world through a dramatically different set of eyes. And while the Harlans were uh, a leading family of Kentucky, they, they always struggled for money. They were not wealthy at all uh, and were frequently in debt. So it was a, it was a total contrast between uh, Harlan's uh, lack of lack of money and uh, understanding of of racial disputes and the Northerners who uh, understood how to become wealthy uh, but didn't really understand the contours of race. Well, it, let's uh, now go to his uh, jurisprudence and in, in, uh, uh, as a justice on the court and um, talk uh, initially about the racial equality cases. One of the first ones you highlight in your work is uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1883, uh, where the court's majority held the Civil Rights Act of 1883 discriminated against white people. Um, and uh, let's talk, uh, let's describe that for us and uh, the significance of Justice Harlan's uh, dissent in, in that. Well, case. it was it was significant in very, in many, many ways. I mean, one significance was that this was a hugely, uh, uh, you know, highly publicized case. You know, all, everybody in the United States knew this case was being debated between the Supreme, before the Supreme Court, precisely because there were so many people in all corners of the country, as you alluded to earlier, Jim, like the North included, uh, where, you know, ticket takers and bakers and innkeepers and all did not want to uh, serve Black people. And here we had this uh, Federal Civil Rights Act that was demanding that they do just that. And all the cases were bundled together. And the court was hoping to settle this. Everybody knew it was a time in 1883 where, as Justice Bradley alluded to in his majority opinion, the nation had, been, had spent decades uh, being convulsed over this racial issue. And there was a sense, particularly in the North, that they you know, we had to just get beyond this. We had to find a way to sort of table the racial issue and, you know, keep on making money, I guess, in the eyes of some of those justices. But Justice Bradley, uh, as I'm sure some of the people here know, was, was not the, history has not judged him to be the, the uh, 
uh, sort of uh, uh, lesser light that they came to view Henry Billings Brown, who was the author of the Plessy, experience, uh, the Plessy case. You know, Justice Bradley was a, a crisp legal thinker, and he delivered a, a crisp majority opinion that was essentially saying uh, the post-Civil War amendments, like the earlier amendments, were meant to restrain states. They were not meant to restrain individuals. So if there's a violation of civil rights, it would be a matter of state law and local law. And passing a federal civil rights act was uh, unconstitutional, went beyond the powers of the federal government. Now, John Harlan understood this to be quite different because, first of all, they'd all lived through the ratification of the post-war amendments. And they knew that one of the very obvious political justifications that was discussed during the, during the, uh, the process with Congress passing these, these uh, amendments was that they wanted to have a federal civil rights uh, act be constitutional. There had been one as far back as 1866, but its constitutionality was in question until the post-war amendments were passed. So it was explicitly done to uh, uh, to, to enable civil rights to be enforced at the federal level, but also to uh, reorder the concept of citizenship that people were not just citizens of the states, they were citizens of the United States and they would have rights that transcended that of state rights. So uh, Harlan, who had again lived through all these uh, terrible experiences leading up to the Civil War, immediately perceived that the gains of the Civil War, the one thing in his mind that had made the war worthwhile was that we had gotten beyond these racial inequalities and the racial things, and that, that there was a to be a forceful uh, uh, federal guarantee of equality in the Constitution. And he immediately perceived, uh, as he as he wrote in his opinion in his his first great dissent, uh, that uh, he felt that through a sort of ingenious use of words and phrases, the uh, the majority was undoing what was the clear intention of the framers of those amendments. Uh, and in some cases, the plain language of those amendments, and certainly the verdict of the Civil War. Um, I had sort of grown up like others, you know, going to law school and all that, thinking that, you know, John Harlan's Plessy dissent was sort of a great document of American history, a great statement of national purpose, and his dissent in the civil rights cases of 1883 was uh, a, a sort of earlier document, which he's still kind of uh, formulating his views. Studying it more, I became more impressed because it combines some of Harlan's, you know, clear-sighted, righteous language. You know, he he seized on a line in Justice Bradley's opinion, where Justice Bradley said, "There must be a time in the, you know, growth of any race where they take the ranks of mere citizens and stop being the special favor of the law." He's referring to civil rights protections for black people. And, you know, Harlan immediately slapped back, you know, it is scarcely fair to say that Black people have been the special favorite of the law. This, I mean, you know, it, it sort of boggles the mind that Bradley would make that, you know, feel comfortable making that assertion. And Harlan immediately seized on it. But he also was in a position of having to then interpret the 13th and 14th Amendments himself and to offer an alternative uh, explanation for uh, how civil rights could fit into the American system. And he did that in many different ways. He talked a lot about, uh, uh, you know, the the reordering of the Constitution under the 13th and 14th Amendment. He talked about, you know, giving real meaning to the idea of badges of servitude uh, that 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 he felt being excluded from commerce, ex you know, kicked out of restaurants, kicked out of uh, uh, inns and transportation at a time when, in the central part of the country, there was like only one inn, one restaurant, one. Uh, theory in each town. And if you're going to exclude Black people from that, uh, you're, you're essentially putting the badge of inferiority and the badge of slavery on them. He also explored in a way that was very farsighted the use of the Commerce Clause. He said that you know, the federal government was busy to underwriting ra railroad projects, uh, and there was never a constitutional issue raised about that. So if they can underwrite national railroads, can't they then require that those railroads obey civil rights laws? And that, of course, was was part of the justification, um, the main justification for uh, approving a civil rights act in in 1965. You know, so um, Harlan was uh, was perceiving the grounds on which the Supreme Court could uh, embrace civil rights in in a, a case called the Heart of Atlanta Motel. You know, 80 years after uh, the civil rights case of 1883. Right, it, it was a, a precursor to so much in the use of the Interstate Commerce Clause there. I think you you illuminate that well uh, in your book. Uh, and about this time, his his sister, 
or I'm sorry, his daughter, Edith, uh, uh, died. And, and uh, describe a little bit of the impact that uh, had on him and, and maybe uh, influential going forward as well. And then we'll get to Plessy and uh, some of the other uh, well-known cases and descents of his. Well, his daughter, Edith, was 26 years old. He had six children. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that's funny about Harlan is people sometimes hear the great dissenter and they think that he's this uh, this righteous outsider who fits this mold of a person who's decided to sort of stand apart from society and challenge the the views of his era. This was the opposite of his actual approach. He was like gregarious. He was you know friendly within the law. He had a a, a big sprawling family that he embraced. He had a lovely marriage with his wife Malvina. They had six children. Uh, a daughter and then three boys born in in close order and then two much younger daughters and uh, their eldest daughter Edith was very much the apple of their eye when they came to Washington she was sort of the co-hostess along with her mother and she would play the piano at the weekly receptions that they would have there and uh, they just adored her they called she was like a second mother to the three boys they all looked up to her tremendously and they staged at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church a, a, a sort of society wedding for her when she married a very promising young attorney uh, and then moved to Chicago where she uh, delivered a baby but then developed typhoid fever and to everyone's shock and surprise died at age 26 and to the deep, deep grief of the parents. This happened within a couple months of the uh, civil rights cases of 1883. Up to that point, Harlan had been very much a uh, sort of go along, get along justice in some ways. I think he was diligent, but, you know, we're, you know, following sort of the edict of Morrison Wade, who was the chief justice at that time, you know, who, who valued consensus, you know, Arlen was very much working behind the scenes. Uh, he wrote a letter to his three sons saying uh, that, you know, he wanted to spend every other, every remaining day that he would have in his life, and he was only 49 at the time, uh, he would dedicate to preserving the memory of Edith, uh, this, this wonderful girl who was the apple of their eye. Uh, and one of the things that she had done is she had taught the sons and daughters of freed men and women in a place called Bethel Industrial School, which was the predecessor church. Bethel, Bethel Industrial uh, uh, was the, was the um, uh, predecessor of, of uh, Metropolitan AME, which is still today the uh, uh, the largest and most powerful black church in Washington. And, um, uh, you know, one thought is that her commitment to civil rights and her seeing sort of the humanity uh, and the human potential of young African Americans impressed him. I think also, again, you know, you've seen a lot of life and death if you're John Harlan on the battlefield, in his family, a large family, they've had, they had the kinds of struggles that large families had. There was, there were people with addiction, there were people with all those kinds of things. And sometimes when you feel this sense of impending doom and this pending crisis, it, it makes you speak out. You know, he, he was sort of felt the need to, to stand up. I think he also felt that the compromises that he had engaged in with Henry Clay, and we know that till the end of his life, he, he revered Clay and he felt like, those compromises that were sought in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s were honorable. They were trying to prevent this war. But with the war having come, he felt like it was much better to get it right the first time than to have to undo the problems uh, later on. So I think he felt all these things combining in him to, to make him speak up in a way that in that moment in 1883, he, he became what we would call the great dissenter. And, and thereafter, he issued numerous very far-sighted and powerful and unyielding dissents that almost all are are law today. You know, well, it's a perfect lead up to Plessy uh, versus Ferguson and, and his dissent there. And I thought you did an excellent job uh, articulating in the in the book, um, uh, just as you've just done about his views on compromises leading up to that time. But there was no such uh, compromise or issue for him in Plessy. Uh, describe for us, please, uh, his descent in Plessy and the impact that uh, that has had um, going forward. Well, there's, there are many notable things about, about this descent. Um, one is that unlike the civil rights cases of 1883, where basically everybody in the United States knew that the court was, was uh, coming down with the decision on this, Plessy was almost totally unknown. I, I was shocked to see even in the New Orleans Times Picune, and this was a Louisiana case, it was not front page news when the decision came down. And part of it is because by the time you're, you're in the mid 1890s when the case is being uh, unveiled, um, 
Uh, by then, people had given up hope that the Supreme Court would ever uh, take an uh, affirmative stance on any kind of these civil rights issues that already, you know, rejected voting rights claims and things like that with Harlan's uh, dissents and objections. So it was pretty far down the line uh, for this. This case was, in many people's minds, sort of unexceptional. Uh, Louisiana had uh, endorsed a separate car law, what they call a separate car law, which, which introduced the separate but equal doctrine into American law. Uh, and Harlan's dissent was notable in, in many, many ways. One is he sort of called out the court for, um, uh, as he often did, for uh, essentially its, its obtuseness in this, in this case. You know, he said nobody would be so wanting in candor as to say that the purpose of this law is to exclude black people, not to give white people and black people equal accommodation. I mean, he sort of called out the sort of common sense does not support uh, this this decision. He also perceived that while this case got almost no attention, he writes in his dissent that someday it will be viewed as negatively as the Dred Scott case. Now, this must have been a joke at the time, right? This is a case nobody was even paying attention to. And yet he's right. Today, we view Dred Scott and Plessy as the two worst decisions in Supreme Court history. And he called it at, the, at that moment, and he was the, the only one to do it. He also engaged in a very forceful uh, articulation of why the Equal Protection Clause was so central to American life. You know, the, the dissent includes these iconic phrases, the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. Uh, there is no caste here. You know, these are the kinds of lines that, you know, we etch on the wall of buildings and they've, they've done a lot to promote Harlan's reputation. But what he was really saying is that this case is, you know, essentially going against the plain language of the Constitution. It's going against the intention of the framers of the uh, 14th Amendment, but it's also going against the foundational principles of the United States. You know, this is him harking back to his childhood, back to the family that he grew up in. You know, this is the United States. All men are created equal here. This was our foundational principle. It's what we're all committing to as Americans. And here's the Supreme Court in this misguided attempt to try to table the race issue, uh, you know, violating this core principle of American life. And as we know, the case got, as we now know for sure, the case got a lot of attention in the black community. It's like in the black community, they weren't on board for Plessy v. Ferguson either. Uh, they, they, you know, most of the black leaders in the country had already shunned and dismissed the case. They weren't even uh, behind Homer Plessy. They thought it was mixed race. Uh, uh, Louisianans trying to uh, stir up some trouble. It was um, discovered, however, because of Harlan's dissent that uh, black newspapers, which are now digitized, you know, immediately began doing separate stories on what Harlan was arguing. And uh, when Harlan died, it became part of uh, a series of, of memorial services in black churches, including one, a very large one at Metropolitan AME, where they read aloud from that dissent. Uh, and it later became an inspiration to the civil rights leaders of the mid 20th century. And so, you know, he, his greatest uh, fame today is that at this terrible dark moment where people felt like the Supreme Court had really gone astray, uh, he provided some hope that, you know, there were other opinions out there that, that, you know, a white person could see the law much the way black people could. And, and that helped Thurgood Marshall, inspired Thurgood Marshall, it helped him recruit plaintiffs, it helped him drive things forward. And, and Harlan's words were there in all of the NAACP legal defense fund briefs, uh, challenging segregation years later. There, there are, we're about to turn to audience questions, but there are a couple other topics I'd like to um, get to uh, in your views on. Uh, for the, one is the Ed Johnson case, um, which I think we're going to do a whole program on. So we don't, uh, it, it was such a fascinating uh, case and, and Justice Harlan's role in it. If, if you might speak briefly to that one, Peter, and then uh, we're not going to get to all the topics that I mentioned at the outset uh, of, of, of in which he was a precursor to uh, law today, but um, in some of his dissents. Um, but I, I would like you to speak to the vaccine case uh, uh, out of Massachusetts, which is another one uh, applicable today. But let's do Ed Johnson, the vaccine case, and then um, uh, your views on 
where Harlan stands uh, in in history, his place in history, and we'll and then. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make this we'll make this the lightning round so that this we can get the some audience round. questions in. So the uh, the Ed Johnson case is a very little known case because it was not a conventional Supreme Court uh, precedent, but it was a case, a horrific case, in which a black man was convicted of raping a white woman under very very dubious legal practices and facts and uh, evidence. Sentenced to be hanged, a black attorney travels up. Uh, from Chattanooga to Washington on a weekend, goes to Harlan as the justice overseeing the circuit that included Tennessee, and was able to obtain from Harlan a stay of execution awaiting Supreme Court review. This by itself was a big deal because the Supreme Court had like largely turned its back on violations of criminal procedure in states despite the post-Civil War amendments. They just had no enforcement mechanism. They know eagerness to do that. It was such an affront in, in Chattanooga that the white community and many communities rose up against it. Uh, the sheriff in town left the jail unguarded and the defendant was lynched. And Harlan then rallied the Supreme Court for the first time and only time in its history to sit as a trial court to try to hold the local officials accountable, which they did. And it was another case that made a tremendous impact in the black community and established a record that enabled Chattanooga just in 2021 to erect a memorial to this case, including Harlan's role in it. But it's an amazing fact, you know, fascinating story that, as Jim said, should be uh, part of a separate conversation entirely. Uh, but it, it also demonstrates Harlan's deep commitment to civil rights and to equality, in this case, in the criminal uh, rights context. Vaccine case, Jacobson uh, has taken on prominence in recent years because Harlan actually wrote the majority opinion in that case. That's right. Yeah. And it uh, it was a challenge uh, by a family that felt that a smallpox vaccine uh, created too much risk. Uh, that It was a father and son challenging the law, saying in their family they'd had some bad experiences with vaccines. They felt like they were weak in the blood or something like that, and that uh, they were being forced to, uh, to to undertake smallpox vaccination in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when um, when smallpox was a, a huge killer, when, you know, huge swaths of the community would be uh, killed under smallpox. And Harlan uh, authored the majority opinion that said that within the state's uh, police powers were the right to protect the health and safety of the community, and that uh, uh, the risk of the vaccine was was not uh, greater than the risk of the disease, and that uh, uh, therefore the the vaccination campaign uh, uh, could could proceed. Um, and uh, what was your third one? I know we're doing the, lightning round. Was the third person there that the I knew was, was uh, about there? I, I I'm very interested in your views about Harlan's place in history, and oh right, he, he's been compared uh, with Holmes uh, and, and there, there's a, you're just gonna have to read Peter's book because there's so much in it <laughs> on all these topics, but uh, let, let's get a, so your well, overview. Uh, I mean, Harlan is is uh, remembered very well in, uh, in history. On the other hand, uh, there are some persuasive cases that he still is underappreciated to some extent. I, I would say that the Harlan narrative, the the way that he uh, saw the law, saw the cases, and and engaged in those prescient dissents, as you alluded to, Jim, is is really an essential story in American law. You really have to know this to see the evolution of American law and uh, and and the role of judges in in creating American law and the roots of wisdom in the law. So I think of it as a, an essential story. He was a contemporary for the last uh, nine or 10 years of his uh, career with uh, Justice Holmes, uh, and they had a complicated relationship. Holmes respected Harlan because he had fought in the war, which was a big uh, point of uh, contention for Holmes that other upper class people had not fought. Um, he, he uh, you know, said some things that in Holmes's parlance were sort of respectful, but, but uh, uh, negative in in the end, you know. This, Holmes was somebody who, you know, we had, we talked about Franklin Roosevelt's uh, first class temperament, but it, that was Holmes saying Roosevelt had a first class temperament and a second class intellect. Holmes never had a good word for, for everyone. He had a, <laughs> and, and he had a, a nuanced opinion on every figure, and uh, he that included Harlan. I, I think he felt that Harlan's sense of righteousness did not uh, add up to the kind of logical. Uh, uh, doctrines that that he was he he Holmes was producing, uh, 
Um, and yet in history, I think that people will see them as an amazing contrast because Holmes was um, a craftsman of the law. You know, he specialized in coming up with the sort of uh, unique doctrine to sort of meet the circumstances and, and force people to look at a case in a slightly different way. Harlan had a much firmer sense of sort of the right and wrong of the law and operated from a, a presumption of sort of core principles in a way that, that Holmes did not. They, their contrast is visible in a case called Giles v. Harris, which was a voting rights case where Alabama passed a constitution that grandfathered in all the Confederates and their progeny, uh, but then gave power to local poll takers to just decide who is a proper repute to be um, to be granted the right to vote or not. Uh, spurred by Booker T. Washington, 5,000 black men who had uh, paid all their taxes, paid all their poll taxes, paid all their dues, and voted in the past, rose up to say they were being denied the right to vote under this situation. Case goes to the Supreme Court. Holmes writes a very sort of uh, uh, Holmesian opinion, I guess to say, where he looks at the situation and says, this constitution of Alabama's is clearly unconstitutional, clearly violates the law, but what can we do? We have no enforcement mechanism. It's not in our power as the Supreme Court to force the people of Alabama to change their opinion. Therefore, it is a, it is a political question. We could try to order the uh, enfranchisement of these 5,000 people who have been dropped by the law, uh, by, by the for, by this constitution, uh, but that would be inappropriate too, because we've already said that the whole voting regime in Alabama is unconstitutional. So why just add 5,000 names to that? Harlan's opinion, his dissent, was that he thinks the court should have uh, rejected the case on jurisdictional grounds, which would have given the plaintiffs another shot at another bite at the apple. But he also said, you know, in point of view, the merits of the case, I think these people are entitled to the right to vote. And that's the kind, you know, Holmes is thinking of these larger kinds of concepts and ideas, and it is brilliant in its own way, and it, it, it inspires us, you know, generations later. On the other hand, Harlan was sort of looking at this and saying, you know, these 5,000 people, the 15th Amendment says they should have the right to vote. They've done everything right. They should have the right to vote. That's Harlan. Yeah, it's a it's a very uh, and and you you do it well in the book uh, as well as, as today uh, articulating those differences and it's interesting to me at the end of the day that uh, that Holmes that that Harlan's experiences and, and uh, which Holmes is you know, highlights the life of the law has not been logic it's been experience uh, Harlan's experiences really influenced him maybe more so than Holmes uh, in, in, in cases yeah, like exactly. that. Exactly, and, and Harlan's experiences were in the realm of constitutional rights. Holmes was was making those comments about the common law, right? You know, he's right. talking about how the common law evolves over time. And uh, and Harlan is talking about, you know, rights that are guaranteed to us as all, as all Americans. And, yeah. you know, and yet there's no question that the way that he saw it, the reason he saw it so differently than all these other justices uh, was because of his life. Yeah. Well, uh, some uh, uh, questions from our audience. Um, let's see. Um, this is from our friend, uh, Judge Hale. <laughs> I hope he doesn't <laughs> mind if he uh, uh, giving him, uh, identifying him as the questioner. Peter, I love the little tidbit in your book about where Harlan was and what he was doing when he got uh, word of his nomination to the court. Could you describe that? Yeah, he was he was playing soccer with his sons, uh, and it was a Thanksgiving <laughs> uh, experience. So um, yes, this this must have been uh, the greatest moment of his life in some ways. You know that he uh, he had succeeded in the in the prophecy. In fact, his 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 wife wrote an autobiographical sketch after his death and and talked about prophecy that was implicit in his name and in in the, the way his father viewed him. And that this was the culmination of, of his life. But it also shows that he was a down to earth guy. He was out there playing soccer with the boys and running around in the neighborhood when uh, when, when the big moment came. <laughs> Good story. Um, another, uh, what impact, if any, uh, did Harlan Sr. have on the jurisprudence of John Marshall Harlan the Younger, who also became a Supreme Court justice. It's it's very interesting, and it's a complicated uh, family story, as are all of our family stories, I guess, in some ways. But they were very, very different 
people um, and their notable differences. I mean, one is John Harlan the um, first, when he was born, there were still people who remembered the sort of Revolutionary War era and the 1812 era when uh, the British were inciting uh, Native Americans to challenge uh, the settlers in places like Kentucky and Harlan's own great uncle, Silas Harlan, is a great martyr in Kentucky and Harlan, Harlan County is named after him. Uh, because he he fought alongside Daniel Boone and was killed by by Indians incited by the British. So Harlan uh, one was uh, skeptical of the British all along. And you know one one uh, line of criticism of Harlan one is that he was not especially embracing of of immigrants. He was a skeptic. He felt like democracy was sort of a precious thing that people had to. Uh, uh, live up to in a way, and uh, and yet whenever he was challenging, he wouldn't talk about uh, uh, you know he he stood up for for the rights of of, of non-whites, but he was always skeptical of the British. It was very interesting in a lot of those cases. His his grandson John Marshall Harlan II was very much a corporate lawyer, right? So the great contrast with the father is that he wasn't a corporate lawyer, while his contemporaries on the court were. Uh, the the grandson was a DuPont attorney and uh, was somebody who revered the British. You know, as a middle aged man, he had gone to England to try to help the war effort and was inspired by Winston Churchill. And he would, you know, his own confirmation was uh, challenged on the grounds that he was too international. He was too supportive of the British. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't enough like his grandpa. And uh, the second Justice Harlan was extremely urbane. Lived in New York. Uh, uh, man, a you know, product of the Ivy League, uh, and you know, would sometimes uh, joke about the contrast with his grandfather, whom he knew. But he, uh, he, you know, one of one of those pithy Holmes phrases is that he called Harlan the last of the tobacco spitting judges, which sounds like an insult to Kentucky. When I first read it, it was like, oh, he's saying he's a backwoods, you know, character. <laughs> but actually, Harlan did like chewing tobacco, apparently, and did. Uh, <laughs> did did chew, chew uh, tobacco on the bench and have a spittoon there. So uh, he may have been just descriptive in his <laughs> there. But uh, but Harlan the second talked about how you know Grandpa could hit a spittoon at twenty feet and stuff, and was sort of acknowledged <laughs> that his own world was very very different. You know. <laughs> uh, so Harlan Harlan too was a supporter of civil rights. He was a, a moderate. Uh, you know, in the court of his day. A uh, very respected uh, figure who who was a mentor to many other uh, uh, jurists and and lawyers. You know his clerks are now uh, senior citizens, but they're still very active in the law. And uh, you know he has his own uh, powerful reputation. Well, th this is a, a a great place to to um, wrap up, and I'll I'll just uh, conclude with a, another Kentucky uh, tobacco chewing story that my uh, my grandfather was sheriff of Owsley County, Kentucky, and he chewed tobacco into his uh, elder years and lived into his 90s, and he finally stopped chewing in his 90s, and I asked him, I said, Papa, why, why have you stopped chewing tobacco? And he says, well, uh, I just got tired of watching people I was talking to go like this and wiping their mouth off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's a long Kentucky tradition, I suppose. Peter, I want to thank you very much uh, for joining me today for this fascinating discussion. Your book is just terrific. I recommend it to all. We have cop. I'm going to hold it up and uh, 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 <laughs> encourage our, our our listeners and viewers and participants to uh, get your own copy, The Great Dissenter. It's available in our gift shop at www.supremecourtgifts.org. And um, we do have several more uh, virtual programs coming up next week uh, on Tuesday, May 2nd, again at noon. Professor John McHale will be joining us for a Law Day lecture on James Wilson and We the People on uh, May 31st. Uh, first at noon, we'll be hosting professors Adam Pritchard and Robert Thompson on their fascinating new book about uh, the, the history of securities law uh, in the Supreme Court. And uh, registration for both events are open and available on the Society's website. And um, I'm hoping to put together another uh, lecture on the Ed Johnson case, which Peter has highlighted in his work on John Marshall. Harlan, that's uh, in the works, we hope. So uh, we encourage you to stay tuned for more. 
And a reminder that a survey is going to go out later this afternoon to everyone who registered in advance for this program. We hope you respond to it. Uh, we do want to make these programs as um, valuable and accessible to as many of you as possible. And uh, with that, we thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.